I am very excited to welcome Sophie Hines, who is one of our, our keynote speakers this year, speaking on From Consent to Sexual Possibilities, Queer Insights into Negotiating Sex. Sophie Hines is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne in Criminology. They research the intersections of gender and sexuality and gender-based violence. Recent publications of theirs include work on consent, street harassment, sexual assault reporting, and technology-facilitated abuse. They are also currently coordinating a course on gender and crime. In their spare time, they are really into gardening and are currently setting up their dream cottagecore garden complete with chickens. We are very excited to welcome Sophie back to QTRG this year. Please give them a hand. Cool. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me as the keynote. It's really an honor to be invited to speak um, this morning. Um, and also a massive luxury to have so much time to explore my research with you all. Um, yeah, and really thank you to the conference organizers for flying me out. Um, my scholarship ran out a long time ago, so it's actually really been amazing. So I really, really appreciate that. And thank you to, um, yeah, the people who have funded this conference as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about my PhD research. Um, but before I start, I would also just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that were on the Wadamalagul clan of the Darug Nation. Um, and I'd also like to pay respects to the Boon Morong people uh, where I live um, in the western suburbs of Melbourne. So today um, I'm going to be talking about my PhD research on consent in queer relationships. Um, so just as uh, a bit of a content warning. Um, my research is sexual violence adjacent, um, but I do take a strengths-based approach and look at um, positive experiences of negotiating sex. So um, whilst I do talk about sexual violence, there's gonna be no explicit talk um, or explicit examples of sexual violence throughout my presentation. Um, but if this isn't uh, a topic that you are comfortable participating in this morning, that is totally fine. If you need to take a break, that's totally fine as well. Um, so I started this PhD research in 2019 and I am due to submit in a matter of weeks. So um, that's very exciting. So I'm right at the tail end. Um, so last year I came and talked about my theoretical framework and this year my presentation is going to be building on that where I've really taken that theoretical framework and um, really applied it to the empirical data that I collected throughout my PhD research. So I hope today to yeah give you basically an extended more finalized version of what I presented last year. Let me check these slides work. Yeah cool. So I'll give you some background about my project first and, and I guess the context for why I did this research. So dominant understandings of sexual consent have really been heteronormative and cisnormative because we really have understood sex and sexual violence as occurring between heterosexual men and women. And so this means that understandings of consent and the problems that we've seen with consent communication have really become synonymous with critiques of heterosexuality. So this is largely the result of shifts in how sexual violence and consent uh, has been understood across academic scholarship over the last 50 years. So feminist sexual violence scholars shifted understandings of sexual violence from an aberrant act of violence to something existing on the continuum of normative heterosexual practice. And so this understanding has really worked to expose sexual violence as normalized and minimized and excused into so in society because of this idea around heteronormative um, gender roles between men and women. And it's also led to a shift in understanding of consent as more complex than the ask of just asking someone whether they want to have sex towards a rec recognition that sexual options and sexual choices uh, are deeply shaped by heteronormative social and cultural expectations. So changes to consent frameworks that we've seen have really been in response to these heteronormative understandings of sex 
following the idea that, you know, women are socialized to be more passive during sex, while men are socialized to be more sexually aggressive and to kish, sort of keep pursuing sex um, despite women's signals of non-consent. So because of this shift in understanding, we've seen uh, a shift towards affirmative consent frameworks in legal, uh, institutional and educational settings, which really require a clear indication of agreement to sexual activity without coercion. So advocates have argued that affirmative consent can empower women to seek agency um, and encourage men to actively seek consent rather than assuming entitlement to sex. However, others have argued that this is really based on the fantasy of repairing heterosexual relations through communication norms and that the stop and ask norm is actually really just reflecting these traditional gender roles, which are the problem in the first place. So whilst, next slide. So whilst feminist understandings of sexual violence of consent have obviously made really important um, contributions and demonstrated the way that consent is shaped by the social world and gendered expectations, this is obviously not queer inclusive. Not all queer relationships are shaped by heteronormative gendered roles, and yet we're still seeing really high rates of sexual violence and unwanted sex in queer communities. And other than it not being queer inclusive, there's actually little understanding of whether sexual consent frameworks are actually leading to better sexual experiences because these consent frameworks are really based in sexual violence prevention, not in positive experiences of negotiating sex. And so this is troubling when consent is not only the line between sex and sexual violence, but it's also becoming the framework for good sex and healthy relationships. And thirdly, there's also been little positive exploration of queer gender and sexuality within sexual violence research. And I think that this is particularly puzzling uh, in light of the understanding that sexual violence is shaped by heteronormativity. So I thought, why haven't we turned to queer relationships to understand what sexual negotiation looks like for those who aren't necessarily negotiating sex within heteronormative frameworks? So essentially the aim of my PhD project has been to queer consent in light of these problems that I saw with the current ways we're understanding it. So to do this, firstly, um, I did this through inclusion of queer participants that have otherwise been marginalized from research thus far. Most pretty much, especially when I started this research in 2019, almost all of the research on consent was with heterosexual participants. We've seen um, a little bit more come out um, with queer participants since I started, but overwhelmingly, the vast majority of research has been with heterosexual people. And secondly, I aim to queer consent through disruption of heteronormative and cisnormative understandings of consent through sort of critically analyzing the inherent limitations with current consent frameworks and developing new framework for understanding sexual negotiation. And thirdly, I queered consent through thinking about what possibilities for a better sexual future we can understand from queer people's experiences and through taking a strengths-based approach that isn't just based in preventing sexual violence. So my research questions were, how do queer people understand consent and negotiate sex? How is this shaped by sexual scripts and gendered norms in queer relationships? And what, if anything, can we learn from queer people's experiences where they feel like they've been able to negotiate sex well? So I really took a strengths-based approach to this research, as I've, as I've said. Um, and this is following Susan Stryker's idea of treating queer experiences as a valuable form of subjugated knowledge. So I'll first talk about the inclusion, which is essentially my methods. So I spoke to people um, for this research who were bi plus, um, which essentially means is an umbrella term for anyone who had sexual experiences with people of multiple genders. So that might've been bisexual, pansexual, etc. Although some people identified as gay or lesbian, but they had had sexual experiences with people of multiple genders. And the reason why I chose this cohort within the queer community 
um, was because I thought, well, if if gender norms and sexual scripts have such a big influence on sexual consent communication, then speaking to people who have sex with people of multiple genders are going to have a really interesting insight into how their how their communication experiences change based on the uh, gender of their sexual partner. So I initially ran three friendship focus groups. So they were focus groups with people who were all friends with each other. And that was really to get an initial idea of people, how people were talking about consent um, and how our friendship groups were talking about sex. And that was to build the initial concepts and language with the queer community um, before I jumped into the individual interviews. So I then ran 33 individual interviews that really um, dived into people's uh, personal experiences of negotiating sex. Um, and then I analyzed those with thematic and narrative analysis. So participants were aged between 20 to 49. They were all located in metropolitan cities in Australia because of COVID. Um, I did manage to do the focus groups before COVID and then um, uh, all the interviews had to be moved online, which in a way was kind of good because I could speak to people across Australia rather than just in Melbourne um, where I was located. Um, and as you can see, there was a real spread in terms of how people identified their uh, gender and sexuality. So during the focus groups and interviews, Participants were asked to recall experiences where they felt like they were able to negotiate sex well and to articulate the, the factors that they believed played a role in their ability to negotiate sex well. So in order to explain why some situations felt better over others, they usually drew comparisons to situations where they felt less capable of negotiating sex. And in these comparisons, some participants described clear and active communication as you know, that really reflected affirmative consent frameworks as contributing. However, all participants really delved deeper than the moments of communication and discussed how the interpersonal, social and cultural norms and scripts that surrounded their sexual experiences actually played a crucial role in how comfortable they felt expressing their choices, their wants and their boundaries. So this certainly reflects what we know in heterosexual studies that heterogendered norms shape sexual communication practices. However, sexual heterosexual studies have almost exclusively focused on the way that norms and scripts constrain sexual communication, which is perhaps unsurprising considering the focus on sexual violence. But this has generally led to a discourse that gendered norms need to be dismantled and challenged to promote more equitable relationships. However, participants in my study painted a really a more complex picture than this. So they described how norms and scripts don't just constrain, but they also provide possibilities for sexual negotiation. So it was clear that sexual consent frameworks that focus on in the moment communication were really insufficient in capturing this broader context that shaped how comfortable participants actually felt to communicate in the moment. However, it was also clear that previous research, which has attempted to capture this context, was also insufficient because norms and scripts didn't only work to limit and constrain sexual communication. And so to explore this, I really needed to find a new framework for thinking about sexual consent that could account for this complexity. So this is where I'm gonna go over queer phenomenology again, which I spoke about last year. So apologies for those who are here, it'll be a little bit of a repeat. Um, but participants in their stories often spoke about negotiating sex as more than making choices about sex, but feeling more comfortable to communicate in some relationships over others. And so I began to explore this idea of, well, what does it mean to be comfortable if it's not about making choices, what does it mean to be comfortable during sex to actually communicate? And this led me to Sarah Ahmed's book, Queer Phenomenology. So this book had actually been sitting on my desk for my whole candidate chart. Like, and I didn't really know quite what to do with it. And I was like, I feel like this is relevant, but it just never really fit with how I'd been thinking about things. 
But I remember in Sarah Ahmed's work that she talks about the phenomenology of the feeling of comfort and how comfort is shaped by social and cultural norms. And I suddenly realized that this book that had been staring me in the face was what I needed the whole time. And so I worked to develop this queer phenomenological framework in relation to sexual negotiation in order to make sense of participant stories and to disrupt current understandings of consent, which are really based in the idea of making an autonomous free choice. So phenomenology has really been underexplored in analysis of sexual negotiation. However, feminist scholars drawing on phenomenology have critiqued the limited scope of sexual consent in capturing the embodied nature of sex and sexual violence. And we've also seen some philosophical discussions um, argue for a phenomenological understanding of consent as well. But to date, there's really been a gap in actually applying this theory to empirical accounts. So far, it's always been um, theoretical accounts only. So it was clear from participants' narratives that negotiating sex was more about more than making an autonomous free choice. And phenomenology allows me to explore how embodiment or the interaction of the body with the world shapes subjectivities and the way that our embodied um, interactions are shaped by social, cultural, and historical locations. So phenomenology highlights the inseparable connection between bodies, the meanings ascribed to them within our specific social cultural location and how we understand and express our gender and sexuality. So phenomenology has primarily been used by theorists such as Simone de Beauvoir and Iris Marion Young to understand the ways that women's bodies are shaped and constrained by patriarchal discourse. This idea that, you know, one is not born but becomes a woman. So the idea that we become who we, our gendered selves through the discourse that we um, soak up and sediment into our bodies. However, Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology not only understands how queer bodies are shaped and constrained by normative discourse, but also the way that queer bodies can disrupt and reshape the social and challenge normative discourses, which I found to be um, you know, a really great framework to use because it's not only looking at the negative, it's also looking at the positives as well. So really taking that strengths-based approach. So in my thesis, I draw on Ahmed's phenomenological understanding of comfort and discomfort to understand how queer individuals were navigating and negotiating their sexual encounters. So Ahmed refers to the feeling of fitting in with the norms, um, sorry, comfort, according to Ahmed, is the feeling of fitting in with the norms of a space or encounter. So she says comfort is where one's body seamlessly aligns or sinks in with its surroundings. So heteronormativity, for instance, sort of functions as a form of public comfort for heteronormative bodies. However, comfort, Ahmed says, whilst facilitating an ease of movement and communication is not always a positive experience either because it can be driven by the compulsion to conform to limiting expectations. On the other hand, Ahmed says discomfort arises when one's body doesn't conform to dominant norms. So bodies that aren't extended by the skin of the social have a lack of residence and they have a restricted mobility in the social world. So for instance, queer bodies might feel uncomfortable in heteronormative spaces as their bodies don't sink in with the norms of that space, which can restrict their movement and communication in those spaces. So I applied this queer phenomenological lens to examine how comfort and discomfort shape sexual negotiation for participants, highlighting the complex interplay between the social scripts and norms and sexual negotiation. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to spend a bit of time demonstrating how this framework helps us to understand sexual negotiation. However, before I move on to that, I want to talk about another important aspect um, of disrupting current understandings of consent, which is about looking beyond gender and sexuality. I'm just going to have some water. So while the focus of my study was on queer sex and sexuality, 
Participants also spoke about norms beyond gender and sexuality that were shaping their experiences. So this is what I've called other queer forms of embodiment that intersect with gender and sexuality a lot of the time, but they pose unique challenges and opportunities for sexual negotiation. So this included forms of embodiment um, around autism and neurodiversity, trans embodiment, fat embodiment, and physical disabilities and chronic illness. So norms around how bodies should act and perform during sex were challenged by participants who described these other forms of queer embodiment as significantly shaping their experiences. So Susan Stryker, again, has also argued that queer studies can be short-sighted in the ways that it privileges sexuality as its focus of analysis. And an intersectional approach to understanding participants' experiences was therefore really important because it acknowledged these intersected forms of oppression and privilege that shaped people's experiences. Um, so it's important to note that there are other structural dimensions that certainly would shape people's experiences of negotiating sex, such as race, class, education, background, religion, family structure, for example. Um, however, these weren't significant themes spoken about by people in my study. Um, which of course speaks to some of the limitations around the work that I've done. Um, participants were mostly white, and although I didn't ask about incomes or education or religious background, the absence of these factors from discussions suggests that participants were from, you know, a particular privileged uh, backgrounds. So in keeping all of this in mind, this framework and this context, I'm going to move to exploring the empirical data now, where I'll demonstrate how participants' comfort in negotiating sex was shaped by social and cultural norms. So because participants were bi class and they had sexual experiences with people of multiple genders, they were often reflecting on the differences between negotiating heterosexual relationships and different types of queer relationships. So when I say heterosexual relationships, I don't mean to imply that bi plus people um, you know, or only queer if they're in a same gender relationship. But I'm using heterosexual to describe relationships where at the time when they were telling me this story, they were identifying as either a cisgender man or woman negotiating sex in an opposite gender relationship. So I'm using heterosexual relationships to describe the dynamics of that relationship um, as described by the participants. So most participants viewed heteronormative sexual scripts and gendered roles as limiting and uncomfortable, as I'll explore shortly. However, for some, these norms could serve as a useful framework that actually facilitated their ability to negotiate sex in certain heterosexual relationships. So heteronormative ideas about men and women's gender roles could provide a sense of comfort and ease in negotiating heterosexual encounters. The familiar, familiarity of these roles allowed for an immediate understanding of, um, you know, their position and the so associated expectations of that sexual experience. So, for example, Lou said when they were identifying as a cisgender woman, it was vastly easier for me to be intimate with men, a bit more accessible because, as I said before, it's easier to find the language to use with men. So whilst participants mostly saw heteronormative scripts as limiting, it's important to note that for some people in some contexts, binary gendered expectations could be useful, particularly for negotiating casual or short-term sexual encounters. However, participants primarily spoke about norms as useful in the context of negotiating queer sexual relationships. So they described that gendered norms in queer relationships and communities could offer them a space to challenge and subvert heteronormative expectations while still maintaining a sense of recognition and belonging within that queer relationship. So Billy, for example, said, having those labels or having those words to throw in there makes it so much easier to discuss our wants and needs during sex. Roles such as butch and femme, which I'm very much into, have definitely influenced my expectations when it comes to sex in a good way, at least for me. So Billy's talking about those sort of roles in queer relationships that have expectations attached to them as actually being useful for negotiating sex. 
So several participants also discussed taking on normative queer roles that had certain expectations attached to them as important for exploring their gender and sexualities. So for instance, Baz discussed how taking on the role of a sub in a sexual relationship with other men and the expectation that he'll be more passive in those roles allowed him to explore non-heteronormative expressions of masculinity. So he said, I like being a sub, I prefer it. I choose that role. And also as a man, it's part of my sexual identity, part of my personal identities. So I don't find it limiting for sexual negotiation because that's where I want to be. So while gendered norms and scripts have really been seen to limit sexual communication in most of the literature, they can also provide meaningful guidance and support for exploring gender and sexuality because they make some queer subjectivities possible and intelligible. So beyond gender and sexuality, some participants also spoke about norms making sex more comfortable to negotiate um, as they can help with some difficulties they experience being neurodiverse. So Baz and Alex in focus group three discussed negotiating sex in sex on premises venues. And they said that there are scripts and norms for negotiating sex within these venues that are almost exclusively nonverbal. And there's a shared understanding of how interest and disinterest in sex can be conveyed through physical touch. So they discussed how these communication norms and these sort of quite strict frameworks for negotiating sex within these venues can actually be really useful for them as neurodivergent people because they can struggle with the social aspects um, of verbal communication. So Alex said, sometimes you just need to scratch an itch and you don't wanna deal with people. So you go, well, I'm just gonna walk into a space where it's dark and steamy and everyone assumes I want to have sex with them. And Baz said, yeah, because I don't want to do the social interaction part. And Alex said, a lot of neurotypical people would shy away from scripts, but sometimes it's good to have them there as a backbone. I tend to use them for certain things or days where I'm less capable. So these are just some examples of the way that norms and scripts don't just constrain, but they can also provide possibilities for sexual negotiation. So according to Sarah Ahmed, Comfort is facilitated when one's body fits in with the social and cultural norms of recognition. And many participants spoke about the comfort of being recognized and validated through social and cultural norms, particularly in queer relationships and spaces. And lining their practices with those norms of recognition actually made them feel more comfortable negotiating sex. But of course, when norms and scripts restrict rather than extend possibilities for gendered and sexual expression, sexual possibilities outside of these normative frameworks could be difficult to negotiate. So many participants spoke about this in the context of heterosexual relationships um, for the reasons that have been demonstrated in prior research around gendered expectations. However, one thing that was a consistent finding in this project that's often ignored by other research is that heterosexual norms have primarily been seen as limiting consent negotiation uh, for women. Uh, however, queer men, or those assigned male at birth in this study, also spoke about heteronormative constructions of masculinity as making it difficult to negotiate sex and say no to sex as well. So for instance, Feather said, I felt really pressured around being in the active role and also submerged in toxic masculinity of you need to want sex all the time and of course you're always up for it and you're lucky to get sex. So I sometimes had difficulties or pressured around being able to name and say I don't want this sex act because it was complicated by the gendered constraints around me. So I just wanted to point out this aspect because I think it also complicates dominant understandings of consent where men are the ones with power, whilst women are the one with whose agency is being compromised. But I found that heterosexual norms work to constrain sexual communication for people of all genders. And that's something that is often overlooked in research. So participants also spoke about norms particular to queer relationships, which were also limiting. For instance, Andrew spoke about the normative expectation between men for sex to always progress to anal sex. And he said, you know, this is one of my beasts with the gay community. The whole everything we do is around anal sex. It's a stereotype. 
there's a lot of gay people that actually think anything other than anal sex isn't real sex. And it took me a long while to say no to doing anal sex because I was thinking, well, I probably should. So he's not necessarily saying that these experiences are non-consensual, but he is speaking about the social and cultural expectations around um, gay sex, making it difficult for him to negotiate other possibilities. So participants also spoke about norms in the context of sex between women being limiting as well. So for example, May said, sometimes I find lesbians, they don't really like fluidity. I guess having a femme gendered presentation has influenced my experiences in the sense that my partners tend to want certain things from me. So May was saying, because she presents as quite feminine, uh, her sex lesbian sexual partners often expect her to take on a more passive role during sex. And she found that to be limiting because that's not all she wanted to do. So while queer sexual scripts allowed some individuals to embrace particular identities, which facilitated sexual negotiation, for others, these norms restricted them in ways they found undesirable. So it demonstrates that norms shape people's sexual experiences in highly individual and context dependent ways. So some of the no these norms might be liberating for some people, but they might be restrictive to others. So beyond interpersonal norms, um, some participants also described expectations within queer communities as constraining their ability to negotiate sex. So for instance, the pressure to embrace sexual liberation paradoxically imposed boundaries on sexual expression, requiring individuals to conform to notions of being sufficiently free and liberated. So ironically, this free and liberated sexuality meant some participants actually felt pressured to engage in situations that were ambiguous in terms of consent, such as sex involving drugs or sex clubs and sex on premises venues. On the other hand, some participants observed that the progressive sexual politics in queer communities could manifest as a form of cancel culture for those who deviated from expected progressive behaviors. So this was particularly evident um, for some participants in discussions around affirmative consent, with some participants expressing fear about negotiating sex because of the potential consequences within queer communities if they misinterpreted consent or somehow got it wrong. So they really felt this pressure to be, you know, the ultimate good queer sexual citizen. And they found it difficult to reconcile the nuanced realities of negotiating sex with these rigid yet ostensibly progressive frameworks for sexual consent. So as Chantal said, the problem with the queer community is, and like the cancel culture within it, is that it gives you this assumption you have to be born as some ultimate queer and it doesn't give you the opportunity to grow. So these wider community level norms could also put pressure on participants to perform in certain ways that constrained their ability to negotiate sex in the moment. And ironically, some of these expectations were consent frameworks themselves that are supposedly supposed to help people negotiate sex. And it suggests that consent itself can be a constraining norm when it's enforced through surveillance and social exclusion. So beyond an intersecting with gender and sexuality, there were also other norms about bodies that participants described as limiting their ability to negotiate sex. So for instance, one participant, Neve, spoke about the ways that fat phobia intersected with their non-binary identity, making it difficult for them to ask for what they want during sex. They described how feelings of shame around their fat body and ideas that fat people aren't sexually or romantically desirable intersected with their inability to be intelligible as non-binary because of their fat body, which accentuates their more feminine features. So Neve described how this struggle to be recognizable as both sexually desirable and as non-binary made it difficult for them to feel comfortable asking for what they want during sex as their body does not conform to norms about gender or sexual desirability. Or in another example, Chantel spoke about the impact of their chronic health condition on being able to meet heteronormative and ableist expectations about sex and pleasure. They described how in heteronormative relationships, 
the expectation for sex to end in orgasm um, made sex difficult for them to negotiate because of their chronic health condition. This wasn't always achievable for them. So Chantel's experience illustrates how the corporate reality of health conditions and disabilities can come into conflict with normative scripts about sex, which can create a sense of discomfort negotiating sex. So according to Ahmed, bodies that do not fit normative standards may struggle to feel comfortable when they're rendered unintelligible within dominant cultural frameworks. And I argue that this discomfort of not aligning with normative frameworks can make sexual negotiation difficult in some circumstances for some people as their bodies are rendered unintelligible. How am I going for time? Oh, am I okay? 10 minutes? Oh, perfect. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, so far I've explored how norms and scripts can facilitate or limit sexual negotiation. However, participants' narratives also demonstrated that queer bodies and queer sex can disrupt norms and scripts in productive ways. So Ahmed says that discomfort is not always negative. It can bring what's in the background and accepted as the norm back to life. Discomfort can give us a different viewing point and disorient how things are arranged. And Ahmed says that every experience they've had of pleasure and excitement about the world opening up has begun with such ordinary feelings of discomfort, of not quite fitting in a chair, of becoming unseated, of being left holding onto the ground. So a queer phenomenological framework not only allows me to explore how participants' experiences of negotiating sex were shaped by social cultural norms, but how the experience of being queer, of not quite fitting in, opened up space to be critical of those norms that they found to be constraining. So because participants were bi plus, they were often reflecting on the experience of negotiating um, existing in between heterosexual and queer norms and of not quite fitting in in either space. So Pallotta Chiaroli and Lobowitz, who are researchers on bisexuality, have argued that bisexuality is often experienced as a type of border existence, not seen as legitimately heterosexual or queer. And they argue that whilst this can be isolating, it can also open up space for experimentation due to the flexibility afforded by being outside of heteronormative and queer normative constructs. And participants also discussed how the experience of negotiating both heteronormal, heteronormative and queer sex and not quite fitting into either space made them critical of the norms present in different relationships. So Judith Butler has also argued that the process of normalization can be undermined by the discursive complexity of negotiating multiple spaces. And participants demonstrated that existing in between generated this discursive complexity and allowed them to be critical of and disrupt constraining norms, which played a crucial role in helping them negotiate their sexual experiences. So for instance, Vivian spoke about being bisexual and how it means that she's sort of become aware of the expectations in both queer different queer relationships and heteronormative relationships. And she said, I do think being critical of gender roles has made my experience of giving and receiving consent much more well-rounded. You're more willing to be critical and therefore you're willing to know things about your own body and other people's bodies that might be uncomfortable. So beyond participant sexuality, some also spoke about the corporate reality of other queer forms of embodiment as also working to challenge and disrupt discursive understandings of sex in bodies in productive ways for sexual negotiation. So for instance, Charles discussed how his autism has opened up possibilities for engaging in sex and relationships beyond heteronormative expectations. Charles described how it meant that he, he felt like he was less likely to get influenced by outside forces, which meant he was more comfortable expressing his queer gender and sexuality and exploring sex. So he said, just being autistic, I was like existing in my own world and it was harder for me to get influenced by all these outside forces. 
So I was just going ahead and being who I was, which was loving in a very sapphic way, I guess. In some other experiences, participants discussed how having trans partners could disrupt the norms around certain body parts being presumed to be um, sexual and open for their partner to touch. They discussed how having trans and non-binary sexual partners made them more aware of different bodily boundaries, disrupting heteronormative assumptions around what sex and pleasure should look like based on someone's gender or sexuality. They said that this then encouraged more open conversations about how partners wanted to have sex and opened up more room for sexual negotiation. Some trans participants also discussed how through the processes of gender affirmation, they experienced changes to their physical embodiment, which opened up sexual possibilities and challenged normative constraints that they'd previously understood their sexuality through. So for instance, engaging in hormone therapy could shift participants' sense of their own bodily possibilities and the possibilities of their body in relation to other bodies too. And this could open up space for engaging in sexual roles that they previously felt unable to based on their expectations of their assigned gender at birth. So I argue that the experience of being queer, which I mean as a verb in the sense of being different, could expose the process of normalization that occurs within particular relationships and communities. Participants described how this opened space for them to be critical of constraining norms, which in turn sort of allowed them in a sense more agency to explore and express different sexual possibilities. So I'm gonna wrap up now by thinking through the third way that I queered consent, which is thinking about what possibilities for a better sexual future can we gain from these stories? So recent scholarship has argued for a shift away from the traditional focus on individual consent and autonomy in sexual interactions. And researchers have emphasized the need to explore how societal norms shape uh, people's bodies' engagement in sexual experiences. However, previous research has predominantly concentrated on how heteronormativity impacts consent. And my thesis, on the other hand, takes a significant step forward by examining the experiences of bi plus individuals moving beyond the confines of heteronormative perspectives. The narratives of participants confirm that heterosexual norms, of course, restrict sexual negotiation. However, my research demonstrated that there are expectations within queer relationships and societal norms related to bodies that, while often intertwined with heteronormativity, uniquely work to shape and constrain sexual negotiation. And these aspects have received limited attention in previous studies. So I argue that exploring factors beyond and intersecting with heteronormativity can deepen our understanding of both sexual violence and the dynamics of sexual negotiation, particularly for queer people. And while gender norms have been the traditional focus of analysis, I contend that any expectation that is enforced through violence, punishment, surveillance, or social exclusion can limit people's ability to negotiate sex. So I therefore propose that in our policy frameworks for comprehending and responding to sexual violence, we must shift our focus from gender as the sole explanatory framework and ex instead examine the mechanisms through which compulsory expectations are enforced and monitored. So this thesis underscores the importance of adopting an intersectional approach. And it demonstrates that gender and sexuality are not isolated constructs but intersect with other societal structures in intricate ways, resulting in unique constraints to sexual communication. So because most of the sexual consent literature has focused on heterosexual participants and sexual violence prevention, gendered norms and scripts have primarily been understood as shaking sexual consent communication in negative ways. However, talking to queer participants and shifting the focus to experiences where they've been able to negotiate sex well, demonstrates that scripted conceptions of sex don't just constrain, but can also give possibility to the ways in which people negotiate sex. So Judith Butler has argued, we can't live outside of norms, but we need to distinguish between the norms and conventions 
that permit people to breathe, to desire, to live and to love, and the conventions that restrict or eviscerate the conditions of life itself. So rather than seeing gendered norms as only having a negative impact, this research suggests that a more nuanced understanding about the ways they limit but also can facilitate sexual negotiation is important. So as one participant, Kieran, said, labels and identities, some people actually find those boxes really comforting and really validating and really good. So while we might not be able to live outside of norms, insights from this research suggest that Individuals whose bodies challenge normative expectations can offer valuable insights into the mechanisms through which a more critical approach to normative expectations can be nurtured and a playful engagement with them can be fostered. So Jack Halberstam's book, The Art of Queer Failure, asks us to consider how the unregulated territories of failure allow us to challenge ordinary ways of thinking. And while I came to this thesis seeking to find out, you know, how pe queer people were doing consent well, or perhaps how they'd mastered the art of negotiating sex, what was actually more compelling was how queer participants' failure to live up to normative expectations was actually the catalyst for them critically engaging with the expectations that limited their ability to negotiate sex. It wasn't just that they'd mastered some skill in sexual negotiation, although some certainly had, but in failing to conform, they developed the ability to be critical of and resist normative expectations. So in conclusion, I contend that we can draw invaluable lessons from queer communities for whom gender and sexuality can be a source of excitement and joy rather than really merely a source of danger or something which constrains their sexual agency. Gender and sexuality can be a place for exploration. However, for this to be possible, gender, sexuality, bodies, and relationships must not be sites of surveillance and compulsory expectations, but rather a constellation of possibilities for understanding ourselves and negotiating our sexual lives. And that's the end. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much, Sophie, for sharing that with us. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming through on Slack. So if anyone has any burning questions, please post there. Um, to get us going, though, I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in how one of the places that you've come at this work from is thinking through uh, the way that the law shapes negotiations around consent as being preventative of sexual violence yeah and I'm wondering what you imagine the kind of future of this work is in coming up against that mm -hmm. kind of like law and policy and what place you see your work having as like challenging or shaping that that's a really good question <laughs> I've been very critical of consent law reform the last few years very spicy on Twitter about it um yeah, I mean, I think what my work really shows is that simply telling someone they have the right to make choices about sex doesn't do anything to actually help them feel comfortable to express those choices. So obviously law, there's a place for law reform in making people's experiences within the criminal justice system slightly better. But the fact of the matter is hardly anyone goes to the police to report experiences. Hardly any of those reports actually progress to the court. And when they do, hardly any offenders actually are prosecuted. And at the moment, what we're trying to do is create these norms for sexual communication through law, which the law is not designed to inform the really nuanced realities of negotiating sex. Um, and there's, I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but we don't actually know how these laws are going to be applied to queer people and queer sexual practices. Um, and, you know, there's particular queer sexual practices where I don't know how it would fit in with affirmative consent frameworks. Um, you know, things such as chemsex, sex on premises venues, um, you know, beats, things like that, where 
you know, consent can be slightly ambiguous and danger can even be part of the appeal of those sexual experiences. It's not clear how these affirmative consent frameworks will be applied to those practices. And I don't think it's been adequately considered in these law reforms because they're based on heteronormative ideas about sex. So, yeah, I guess I see my work as um, a challenge to those, the ways that we're kind of conceptualizing consent in these policy and law frameworks um, and a way of thinking about it in a different way that isn't to do with law. And I don't think my work could be translated into a law reform and I wouldn't want it to be either. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Mm. Um, we also have a question from Jessica McKenzie, yeah. <laughs> um, which is also an invitation, I think. So uh, thank you for your talk, Sophie, a fascinating insight into this space. I was caught by the normative scripts within queer relationships you highlighted and how dominant scripts of what queer sex should be impacted some of your participants. Mm. Could you please elaborate on how your participated navigated these norms or pressures? Mm. Yeah, I think one thing that was really interesting um, about the way participants resisted um, these normative queer expectations was actually, and heteronormative expectations as well, was actually choosing to only engage with certain sexual partners where they didn't feel like they were going to be compelled to act in particular ways. So, um, you know, for example, a lot of people said, I actually wouldn't have sex with a straight man or a straight woman anymore because I don't know how well I would be able to resist those heteronormative um, understandings of sex. Or a lot of trans participants said, I'll only have sex with other trans people because there's more of a shared understanding and I won't feel compelled to act in certain ways that are expected of me. Or a lot of people like, I'll only have sex with other bisexual people who have a shared understanding. So I think part of the resistance to those scripts um, was actually being a bit more conscious around who they ended up having sex with in the future. Um, and I think that just really goes to show as well how much these scripts can shape. It's like the, the difference, you can know something, but actually in the moment being able to resist that and not feel compelled to act in certain ways is really tricky. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in our lives that we could apply that to, right? And that's also the same case in sex. So, yeah, I think that's a really interesting form of resistance is actually being more conscious around who people or where people would have sex. Yeah, that's such an interesting insight. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's our time. Um, so everyone, yeah, could we please give Sophie another hand in thanks? Thank you.